All right, so now the recording has started. So Samir, we are very happy to have you on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Okay, okay. So you're at the University of Ohio. So I presume you're recording from there too? Because sometimes you're out visiting other institutions and stuff. No, I'm at, at Ohio State, Columbus. At Ohio State University. So you, of course, have done a lot of theoretical physics. You've had a long career, done many important things. So just before we dig into all of that, would you mind telling us what you're working on at the moment? Do you have any active projects? I'm at, at the moment most interested in understanding cosmology. Because as you know, cosmology has some very deep puzzles, like what happened at the Big Bang and... Uh, What's the solution of the cosmological constant problem? And there are many other issues these days about things called the Hubble tension and so on. And at least some of these questions are obviously connected to quantum gravity. Like what happened at the Big Bang, you would think has to do with quantum gravity, but also things to do with the cosmological constant. They are physics issues at the scale of the cosmological horizon. And that is not so different from the black hole horizon. So I'm hoping to use whatever we have learned about black holes from quantum gravity and now to use them to understand how quantum gravity plays a role in resolving the puzzles of cosmology. That is very interesting. So, <clears throat> so are you saying that this does not necessitate quantum gravity or are you saying that understanding these solutions could help us sort of as a stepping stone in the direction to understand quantum gravity? Yeah, I think we may be surprised to find that even in places in cosmology where we did not expect quantum gravity to play a role, actually the solutions to puzzles may lie in quantum gravity. And the reason is that's exactly what happened in black holes. So everyone thought that the black hole is a huge object, big size, several kilometers in radius. So it should all be semi-classical physics except perhaps right at the singularity, which is you know, very dense. But that's how you get into things like the information paradox because they happen near the horizon. And the whole puzzle was that, you know, the black hole is such a huge object. Everything is described by semi-classical physics. Everyone thought they did not need quantum gravity to solve it. But what we have found is that the solution to the black hole puzzles lie in string theory, which is the theory of quantum gravity. And these effects change the behavior at the horizon. And so now if you turn that over to cosmology, if you're having any puzzles which you can't understand at the scale of the cosmological horizon, then perhaps we were wrong to think that semi-classical physics was applicable for whatever issues in quantum or in just cosmology that we have been looking at. Maybe quantum cosmology is crucial. And so I think the lessons of black holes should directly apply to cosmology. This is very interesting. This is something that I hope that we can unpack a little bit along the way. Sure. So uh, so I think one of the things that you're quite well known for is the development of this fastball proposal or, so, or understanding black holes via these microstates that I think you're referring to when you say this microscopic description via string theory of black holes. Uh, so... Mm -hmm. Of course, Hawking surfaced the information paradox about 50 or 60 years ago. Yes. So there was some time where interest sort of decreased in this field. So I think it was believed that small local corrections to Hawking results could resolve this paradox, but people didn't really bother doing it, maybe. Uh, and I think then you came along and showed that that was actually not correct. And in fact, considering these corrections even violated some inequalities even more severely. I mean, for example, the strong sub-additivity of entropy. Uh, so what led you to work on this, uh, this problem? And I think after this, this reinvigorated interest in the information paradox in 2009? Yes. So it's very interesting that there seemed to be a big divide in the community of physicists on the information paradox between the people who work on traditional general relativity and quantum gravity on the one hand, and people doing string theory on the other. So people doing normal quantum gravity were all very familiar with Hawking's derivation of the information paradox. And they had looked at it quite hard and they had concluded there is no solution to this. And they generally thought that unitarity would be lost in quantum gravity. Many of them thought that. 
or they thought there would be uh, somewhat far out solutions like uh, the baby universes or something like that. But they were certainly happy with the idea that you cannot get the information of the black hole to come out in Hawking radiation. On the other hand, in string theory, the people had come to string theory from a background in particle physics where everything is always unitary. So they thought if a black hole forms and evaporates, it's going to be unitary anyway. And maybe there are just some details we don't understand, but they had never looked that carefully in general. Some people had, but most people had never looked very carefully at Hawking's original derivation about how this uh, unitarity is lost. So the string theory people were just thinking at the back of their minds that some small corrections or small effects, some higher order effects, once we add them to Hawking's you know, simple calculation, oh, that should take care of the problem. So it was this divide was growing and growing with the string theorists not actually worried about the puzzle and the general relativity people thinking they had actually no tools to solve it and maybe there was no solution and information is lost. That is very interesting. And then what happened was I was giving a series of lectures at CERN in 2009 and Ed Witten was also visiting CERN. And then after that, in his usual very polite and courteous way, he sent me an email saying, why do people work so hard, still talk so much about the information puzzle? You know, if you have small corrections and so on, it should take care of it. Why are people so worried about it? So then we had a long email exchange lasting almost a year. But I tried to explain to him, it doesn't work like that. Look, you know, the pairs are coming out like this. The entanglement is growing. And, you know, this is the general literacy problem. And it was interesting. He's very polite and very courteous. And he would write me long mails. And I would write back long mails. But I just couldn't convince him. Yeah. And so I said, okay, this has to be proved. Once, I, once you, If you don't make it rigorous, then just saying that, you know, this may happen or that's the puzzle isn't convincing to anybody. So I sat down picked up books of quantum information theory and made it into a completely rigorous theorem. And the rigorous theorem says that if you have any approximation to semi-classical physics at the horizon, which is what you take to be you know, the picture of a black hole, that the horizon is a smooth place where you leading order physics is just semi-classical physics. And uh, at the singularity, new quantum gravity effects could happen, but at the horizon, we assume semi-classical physics. So there can always be small corrections to that because we don't exactly know the theory of quantum gravity, but supposed to leading order is just normal semi-classical physics because the horizon is a smooth place. If that were true, you cannot actually resolve the information puzzle and you will lose unitarity. So I think making that rigorous uh, was of interest to, it certainly woke up some part of the string community who started realizing that, hey, wait, this is not so simple. We have been assuming that the black hole has the traditional structure that we have learned from GR, even people doing ADS CFT and so on, when they wrote a black hole in ADS, they were just writing the usual metric of the black hole. And now that uh, it came to them that if you actually don't make something, a radical change to this picture of the black hole, you cannot actually get the unitarity that you are looking for and, and hoping for from string theory. And so then of course, uh, people uh, took an interest in the puzzle. Uh, people were always uh, interested in the question. I think they just hadn't worked on it with enough focus to see that something should be done about it. Uh, but I think this, uh, as you said, reinvigorated some interest in the problem and mm. uh, it led to quite a, quite a few people working on it. Wow, that, that is very interesting that it could be such a dish renaissance between string theory people and people working on GR. So you said that this was a big surprise and generated interest from, from the string community. How was it for the GR community though? The other side of the coin. So it is very interesting that the GR community, somewhat unfortunately, in my opinion, has been disconnected from a lot of the progress that has happened in the string community. So for example, in the string community, there was this very important result of Strominger and Wafa that we can actually count the states of a black hole and get the entropy correctly. But most, most GR people, have not actually learned string theory to the point where they could go to a blackboard and derive this very important result for themselves. And mm -hmm. that's because learning string theory is a bit of a steep curve. And so it doesn't take that much effort. I mean, now there are reviews where you could just go and learn this quite easily, but somehow the culture has been that people have not done that. And so if you ask a GR person, 
traditional general relativity or quantum gravity person, what is their view on black hole entropy? They wouldn't actually tell you, oh, after knowing Strominger and Wafa's work, we all agree that the entropy of a black hole is the counter states. Some of them would tell you, no, a black hole can hold infinitely many states inside it. For example, you could make a bag of gold all the way back to the understanding of Wheeler, which is also the same idea as a baby universe hiding inside the black hole. Or you could, they would just say that information is lost in black holes anyway. Evolution is not unitary. So the big results of string theory about, you know, either about the entropy, uh, a la Strominger Wafa, or about the results on uh, unitarity, a la Fuzzballs, they have not actually penetrated the general relativity community because the divide between string theorists and traditional GR has just grown and grown. And I think that is very unfortunate because string theory is not that difficult to learn. I think it is our fault as string theorists that we have not made a bigger effort to extract the basic results and to reach out to convey this to the GR and quantum cosmology community. Do you think that this uh, growth has continued between string theorists and uh, general relativity people today? I think so. I think the people in general relativity are might be feeling that they are further and further away from understanding what string theorists talk about, because we get more and more technical in string theory, and we don't often put our results in uh, physical terms and their explanations and their computations in a way that they could themselves go home and you know start on a piece of paper and by the end of an hour say, okay, I now understand the derivation of entropy for black holes in string theory. Uh, we haven't maybe given it to them in that fashion, or at least we haven't encouraged them to understand what we have done in a concrete way so that they could use it. Could you maybe elaborate a bit on the GR community? So what would this be for subfields specifically? Is it people working on gravitational waves or people working on GR theorems or? So it's a large community and they have done very valuable work in many different uh, areas. So of course, these days there is work on gravitational waves, but that's the gravity community, not necessarily the quantum gravity community. Okay. But the quantum gravity community has done a lot of good work in the past on understanding quantum cosmology, for example. So okay. they had uh, they developed the Wheeler debate equation, then they applied it to you know simple models of what's called mini superspace cosmological evolution. They did the whole ideas of bubble nucleation of how universes could tunnel from from nothing, or if you have two different vacuum, a true vacuum and a false vacuum, how bubble would nucleate and tunnel out. So there were many important results in uh, quantum gravity and quantum cosmology, uh, and a whole field has developed around that. And as you said, singularity theorems also uh, in the past, which were so important for both black holes and cosmology. So a huge community of people had developed all this work. And somehow string theory started from a very different point because it started from scattering of two gravitons, just perturbative Feynman diagrams in string theory. And they came to things like black holes later, you know, after enthusiasm in the area was generated by, you know, Suskind and the CGHS model and so on. Uh, so the string theorists have been somewhat disconnected from the same physics questions that the people in uh, quantum gravity and uh, quantum cosmology were interested in. And so I think the fields developed differently and somehow they never quite connected. So after 2009, when this, that's after your discovery that sparked new interest in the information paradox, what happened after that? So there were certain attempts that wanted to, uh, to okay, so now you pointed out the actual problem. So it, it wasn't that easy that local corrections could resolve the information paradox. People tried everything from black hole complementarity to firewalls. Do you have sort of a brief outline of the history of what happened after that and what models sort of failed and what models succeeded and maybe live still today? So uh, the two kinds of things which uh, I would say failed are the following kind. So first, as you mentioned, the idea of small corrections that Hawking, of course, did a leading order calculation with some semi-classical physics and proved that when black holes evaporate, then quantum mechanics is violated. So the issue of small corrections is that, okay, if you take small subleading effects into account, how do you know they don't actually restore unitarity and solve the problem? And the reason for that kind of a belief in people had been that 
a black hole emits a huge number of particles by the time it evaporates, because the black hole is a big object. And if you make small, small corrections to a large number of particles, there could be some delicate correlations between them that might actually be carrying the information. So it wasn't actually easy to uh, prove that small corrections can't do the job. And that's why people have been thinking that small corrections might in some subtle way uh, encode the information. Mm -hmm. Remarkably, nobody had actually ever tried to write down a model where the information would come out. So all they had to do in principle was to write the radiation in Hawking's uh, way of getting it, then maybe add small corrections here and there. Didn't have to be the correct ones, just some toy model. You make a 1% change here, a 1% change here and so on, and then demonstrate, look here, I have something, but I only made a 1% change to Hawking's evaporation. And look, now it is unitary. Even if they had made a toy model like that, they would have found they can't do it. But somehow nobody tried to do that. So they just thought that somehow if you put lots of correlation between lots of particles, you can hide as much information as you want in it and thereby solve the problem. So the small correction theorem actually proved that it doesn't matter how you try to make these small 1% corrections. Any way you try to do it, it's not going to work. It's a general small it's a correction. Gen That's right. So it doesn't matter what are the sources of the small correction, since of course we don't know the quantum gravity theory, you might say. If we don't know how string theory does something, or if we don't even know that the theory is string theory, we, if we don't know anything about the quantum gravity theory or what kind of corrections it might give you, then you would say, if I don't know what the small corrections are, where would I go looking for them? Maybe these kind don't work, but some other kind might work. But that's the power of the small correction theorem. It tells you if you make small corrections of, let's say, 1% to each pair which is emitted, it doesn't matter how you make them. The total amount of information you can get out is bounded by two twice of 1%, which is 2%. Right. So unless you make an order unity correction, you simply can't solve the information puzzle. So firstly, all the things which were based on small corrections uh, were ruled out. Do you think people embrace they... this or... Did, did it still take some convincing before people stood behind this? So unfortunately, people have not, in my opinion, fully absorbed the lessons of the small correction theorem. And so a lot of the work that keeps, keeps being done today, which in my opinion is not correct, is still making the same mistake of trying to bury small corrections into there somewhere and try to solve the problem. So... Uh, Maybe we can talk about come that come back to that in, in more detail when we start discussing other things that people do these days. But in many ways, the small corrections idea is very persuasive because you do see that a large number of particles are being emitted. And so why can't you make little, little corrections and hide the information? You really have to go into understanding how the pairs are emitted. That is Hawking's own original calculation to understand where the difficulty is. Mm -hmm. And I would just say that a lot of people have not focused on understanding Hawking's original work and then how small corrections cannot fix the problem. And so a lot of the work being done today is just, uh, in my opinion, incorrect because they haven't actually understood the lessons of the theorem. But on the other aspect which you mentioned, what are the other things which uh, got ruled out? The idea of complementarity as started by Susskind and others way back in the early 90s. It was an idea which was trying to say the following, that perhaps there could be two kinds of realities. Uh, in one picture where you're sitting outside the black hole, maybe everything looks unitary. In another picture where you fall into the black hole, uh, maybe the information goes into the black hole and doesn't come out. So in one picture, when everything is unitary, information comes out. In another picture, if you fall go into the black hole, the information doesn't come out. And then you would ask, how can that be? How can information be both inside and outside? Because we know that linearity of quantum mechanics doesn't allow quantum cloning. It doesn't allow us to make two copies of quantum mechanics. And Susskind attempted to make a theory along the lines, well, normally you cannot duplicate anything in quantum mechanics, but since you can't actually go inside a black hole and check what's going on there and then come out to compare with what is outside, because it's difficult to come out, Maybe in the case of a black hole, you are allowed to do quantum cloning. And so this kind of an idea, uh, it was a far out idea, but interesting nevertheless. And I think what the firewall people did, uh, many things were not correct about their argument, but this part was correct. Uh, 
they used these ideas of the uh, the bit models, which were used for the small correction theorem, they applied them to the Susskind's idea of complementarity, and they showed it cannot work. So at least there has been progress in the sense that the complementarity idea is now uh, is gone. But it's not really gone in the sense that some people try to still rescue complementarity at the expense of non-locality. Hmm. So the idea of wormholes came up as a way of trying to save Susskind's complementarity. So you try to say that the black hole still has the structure you think, it has a smooth horizon, so it will like behave the way Hawking thought, but perhaps there's a wormhole that starts from inside the black hole and comes all the way out at infinity and can dump information out by a secret channel which is going through a wormhole. So the idea of wormhole sort of, which was always there in physics but had mostly been relegated to science fiction, came back as a way of trying to save some aspects of complementarity. So even though we say that some ideas got ruled out, and in my opinion, they should be ruled out because I think they are ruled out by small correction theorem. One, the idea of small corrections, and two, the idea of complementarity. Nevertheless, there are many attempts today which are still trying to keep some version of these ideas uh, in there. Uh, I don't think they work very well. They're only into some trouble, and maybe we can discuss that uh, later on. But uh, these uh, these ideas uh, have not completely lost their appeal. Right. So then also, I think the firewall proposal came. Uh, yeah. And you also have a paper that is quite old by now that is called The Flaw in the Firewall uh, yeah. Explanation. So what is what, what exactly is a firewall? What problem did it set out to solve? And what was the flaw in the argument? Okay, so what happened is that the firewall people set out to do something very simple. They set out to prove that Susskind's idea of complementarity was wrong. That you could not have two realities. One for the person outside the black hole where the information comes out. And another reality inside the black hole where the information stays in. And the reason was very simple, which as they point out in the firewall paper correctly, that if you actually create a, there, that if there is any picture where the horizon is smooth, that was the picture for such kind where somebody is trying to fall into the horizon. In the picture where the horizon is smooth, you will create a pair, entangled pair just like Hawking around the horizon. And if you create that pair, then if one member of the pair is outside, one is inside, the entanglement between the outside and inside is growing. It doesn't matter what happens inside, the partner outside its entanglement with the black hole is growing. Well, that's what Hawking had said. So if you keep using that particular picture where the horizon is a smooth place, how are you ever going to get out of what Hawking had done? I it was a that. valid criticism of such kind of thing all the way from the beginning, but somehow nobody had tried to make it precise and try to shoot down complementarity. And the firewall people said, okay, this shows that it cannot work. And in that they were correct. So again, you were try to put wormholes and so on and try to rescue the idea, which is what Susskind and Maldestina did a couple of years later, but let's leave that aside for now. This was the firewall argument. It was just saying that, look, Hawking showed you that you're going to get entangled pairs. And if there's any picture in where the horizon is smooth, then uh, you will get entangled pairs. So what, what are you going to do about it? How what people, uh, the mistake they made was to say, they recast it in the following language. They said, so anybody falling into the black hole will therefore necessarily feel that he is getting burnt up at the horizon. And their idea was very simple. Their idea was that if you don't have a smooth horizon, so we know a smooth horizon can't solve the puzzle. So what's the opposite to a smooth horizon? They didn't have any example of what would not be a smooth horizon, except they said fuzzballs can do that for you. We're going to come to fuzzballs later, but fuzzballs are basically objects which are just like planets. They don't have a vacuum around the horizon. They're just like you know, solid objects the size of the horizon. So if you have an object like that, the near its surface is going to be very hot. So it's very hot because then as the radiation moves out further and further, it will get redshifted away and become cool uh, at infinity. But uh, near the surface is going to be very hot. And so they said, when you come near this hot object, uh, so uh, then you're going to get burnt. So it's uh, sometimes people ask me, you know, 
are fuzz balls in contradiction to firewalls or not? It's not the right question. The firewall is a kind of behavior. So they were so fuzzball is an object. It tells you that the black hole has a different structure. It's like an object. But uh firewall is a behavior. It says that as you come near the object, do you smoothly fall through the horizon or do you feel very hot and get burnt? Mm -hmm. So they were arguing that if we accept that fuzzballs are the correct solution of the information puzzle, then they were saying if you come near the fuzzball, you will get burnt. You can't ever get the feeling that you might be falling through. Now, in this aspect, they were not correct. And they were not correct because the mistake was the following. The effects of quantum gravity which lead to the first ball don't start when you get very close to the surface of the first ball. They start a bit further outside. And this was the mistake they made. They have to start a bit further outside for the following reason. Suppose I'm an, a person who's falling into the black hole. Now my mass is not negligible. It is something. Suppose my mass is 50 kgs. So when I go near the black hole, the horizon actually becomes bigger because if it eats a new mass of 50 kgs, the horizon is going to be of a larger radius. So what you have to ask is, do the first ball effect start at the old radius of the black hole or the new radius of the black hole? Right. And it turns out they must start at the new radius of the black hole because if I wait till I reach the old radius of the black hole, then I'm already trapped inside the new radius, the new horizon. And if I have causality in string theory, which to my understanding is always true, we cannot violate causality in string theory. If I'm trapped inside the new horizon, it doesn't matter what I do when I reach the surface of the old uh, fuzzball or old black hole, my information can never come out the new horizon because I'm trapped inside it. So, uh, all the new physics of first balls has to start at the new horizon, not at the old horizon. New horizon meaning into, <clears throat> the horizon of the black hole after you fell into it, such that where it had absorbed you and grown. That's, that's right. So the original black hole had a mass m, and the new black hole has a mass m plus delta m. Then there was a short shell radius for the old black hole. There's a larger short shell radius for the new black hole. And then if you go back and look at the firewall paper, one crucial assumption in their computation is that all new effects start only when the infalling object reaches the surface of the old black hole. And therefore, not at the point when you're crossing the new horizon. And if you do that, then by causality, if you assume causality in your theory, the information can never come. So how okay. causality actually works uh, with first balls, we can talk about that later. It's a whole thing we have been developing for some years under the title of the Vecro hypothesis to where and how causality actually works and is compatible with first balls. But the flaw in the firewall argument was that you can actually uh, make a model for how the quantum gravity behaves in such a way that if you're looking at low energy emission, like the Hawking quanta are very low energy, then you, know, you get unitarity. But if a high energy object is falling in, like a person of mass 50 kgs has mass or energy much bigger than the energy of a single Hawking quantum, then he can get an approximation to free fall as he's falling through. So he does not have to get firewall behavior. And in fact, you can make a bit model where if your person is falling in, but his energy is much more than the energy of one Hawking quantum, then you can actually get smooth infall to leading order in this bit model. So you can actually make an explicit bit model counter example to the firewall argument. And we wrote a paper showing that in 2015. Hmm. So we don't know that we'll actually have uh, you know, smooth infall behavior. We don't know enough about the dynamics of fuzzballs to prove that. But the argument of firewalls is not correct because you can easily make a bit model for a counter example. And the right. source of that was the difference between the new and the old horizons. So we don't know that this model is correct. So it may still be that when you fall into a first ball, you feel it, that you're burnt up and so it's like a firewall. But the argument that you can just argue that abstractly, that's not true. Right, right, right. So fastballs. So you're one of the people behind fastballs. At what point did you start developing this? Was this after having addressed these issues or was it even before or was it in parallel? It was actually 
quite a bit before any of these things to do with the small corrections theorem. The first ball idea was first in, given in a paper of 1997 June. So I had been working for many years on trying to resolve the black hole puzzle. In fact, that was my seventh year of working full time on this question. And it seemed to be going nowhere. Tried every possible thing. And you would think that something is working and you work on it for one day, sometimes a week, sometimes a month, in one case for a whole year. And then you find there's a flaw. It doesn't mm. work. It's almost like trying to solve a math problem. Sometimes you work on a math project problem and you almost think you've solved it. You find, oh no, here is a flaw. And one flaw and the whole thing is gone. So this kept happening year after year. And then finally, string theory also was being developed at that time and deep brains had come up and the ideas of entropy had come up and we were understanding more and more about black holes. And then we found very miraculously that if you actually try to make a black hole in string theory and you estimate the size of a bound state of strings, it's not small like a little dot in the center of the black hole like people thought. The size of the bound state is actually always of the size of the horizon. So this was the uh, uh, start of the whole fuzzball idea. After all, in string theory, you have to make a black hole out of the objects that you have in the theory. You have strings, you have brains, and all their couplings and tensions and masses are all fixed. String theory has no free parameters, and that's why we believe in it. It's so beautiful that not all the properties of strings are completely fixed. So if you want to make a black hole, you have to make it out of those objects. You can't add a new object saying, I just want one more scalar field, or I want one more particle of this mass. No, string theory is rigid, doesn't give you any freedom. So you make a black hole out of the objects in the theory, and you ask what it's going to look like. It's a completely well-defined problem, giving you zero freedom. And here is the miracle. You try to make a bound state of strings, a large number of strings to make a large black hole. And you find that the old idea picture of black hole is just not true. People thought that when you go to strong coupling, strong gravity, the gravity will squeeze all the mass to a point and create a whole vacuum region and somewhere there'll be the horizon and then empty space outside. That was the picture of the black hole. But you find that strings, if you put a lot of strings, the more strings you have, you look at the wave function of these strings, it spreads out and out all the way to the horizon. It's never squeezed to a dot. And it works out quite beautifully because you put any coupling you like, any number of strings you like, you put more strings, it just becomes that much bigger. So that time this was just an estimate. We didn't know how to actually make these wave functions. We only had some tricks to estimate the size of the power state. Mm -hmm. And the size was a function of seven parameters, the string coupling, the various compactification parameters, the number of different kinds of charges. And you find the size, est size estimate that we had at that time. It's a complicated function of these seven parameters, but it's miraculous, the, miraculously the same complicated function which gives the classical horizon radius of the black hole as a function of those seven parameters. So that was fairly convincing to me at least that somehow when we actually understand the states of black holes, they are not going to be the traditional one which all the masses in the center, then there's a vacuum and the horizon thing which gives rise to all the paradoxes. These things are going to be like planet-like objects made of very stringy stuff. And uh, they would be like what these days we call fuzzballs. But it was later in 2001, when working with Oleg Lunin, we actually found the structure of the simplest first ball. Before that, we couldn't actually make these objects. But once we started understanding how to make them for the simplest case, mm -hmm. uh, then it became clear as to what was their structure, why was their wave function spreading out, what was holding them up, how the no hair theorems of black holes were being bypassed. And then once we got the simplest solutions, then we got the next more complicated solutions, and then Many, many other people got in the game who had a lot more technical power than me. Uh, people like Bina and Warner and Martinek and Justo. And, and they made a lot of uh, new kinds of solutions. More uh, and more realistic toy models. More and more realistic models. Uh, there were many nice papers uh, with uh, Skenderis and Taylor with the two charge, then with Bina and Warner with the three charge, then Russo, Turton, Shigemori. Lots of people with lots of technical power got into the game. And uh, it's very interesting. Every time so far over these last 25 years or so that anybody has been able to make an actual structure of a black hole, actual bound state of strings and brains, in every case they have found that there is no horizon. And that's very important because if you could find even one case where there was a horizon, 
Right, right, you right. You could use that one to get the pairs of Hawking and you can, again, crash the unitarity immediately. So it's important you shouldn't be able to find even one case. And over the last so many years, two decades or so, people have made so many families. And whenever you are able to make one, actually make the wave function of a microstate, in every single case you find, there is no horizon. It's like a planet. So where is the fastball program now? So you said it has been been more realistic and more realistic um, models. So where is it now? What some, what some of the standing problems and challenges? Okay, so there are many, many different directions. I think it's a very rich field. It's a very promising field. So it's going in several different directions. So of course, one very core direction is to understand the fuzzballs better. So people ask, the initial fuzzballs were made with charge equal to mass because extremal things are easy to make. And because if you have charge, then it sort of holds things apart a little more easily. So you know, it's, it doesn't crush that easily. And it was also made with just two charges. And then people started to make three charge fuzzballs and some non-extremal fuzzballs were made, the JMART solutions. Uh, they also had a lot of rotation, the early fuzzballs, because rotation also helps to keep things apart. So you can make things which are neutral. They have no charges, right. but they have a lot of rotation. I had a paper with David Turton about that. But then it would be really nice. People keep asking, can you actually make a fuzzball which has no charges, uh, no rotation? So it's like a Schwarzschild black hole. Right, right, right. And the size also should be like the Schwarzschild black hole. If you end up making a size which is four times the Schwarzschild radius, you would say, okay, then I can just get a neutron star. You know, I, I already had those things. So size which is close to the Schwarzschild radius. Because there are many theorems that say that if you make something which is like the Schwarzschild black hole, but same mass, but the like if you take a fluid sphere whose mass is less than two and a quarter m, the Bukdal theorem tells you it has to implode and make a black hole. So there were all these theorems which tell you that uh, you can't come close to the Schwarzschild radius and not collapse. Right. And very interestingly, recently there are papers of uh, Heidemann and Bach which have actually succeeded in making microstates which have no charge, no rotation. The size is just an infinitesimal amount above the Schwarzschild radius, so just the compatibility scale outside the Schwarzschild radius. So the only thing they have which would prevent it from being called a microstate of the Schwarzschild hole is that they still have some scalar hair. But scalar hair are not so hard to remove. In the past, we have always been able to make black holes in the extremal case, which have no scalar hair. So I'm hoping they can get rid of the scalar hair at some point. And I'm quite excited about that work because that would actually be a microstate for the short hole. Why is it, uh, <clears throat> why would it be a big achievement to have a microscopic uh, description of the Schwarzschild black hole in particular? Because somehow those are the most difficult to make. So as I was saying, if you add charge, the problem with the black hole always has been that if you try to, let's say, make a fluid sphere, and you make its radius close to the Schwarzschild radius, let's say anything less than two and a quarter M. Two M is a Schwarzschild radius, but if you go to two and a quarter M, the gravitational field is so strong, it just sucks it in, okay? So if you have charges, it slightly lowers the power of the sucking in power, it reduces the attraction. So if you have charges, it makes it easier to make the solution. If you have rotation, it also flings things out by the centrifugal force, if you like. So it's easier to make the solutions. So. Uh, whenever people ask, uh, how many solutions have you made? How how well is your program, is the fuzzball construction program going? Uh, there are two answers to that. One is that we know how to make them in principle. So we don't actually have to go and make all the states. And that's usually, you know, my my tag. I, mean, I don't have any doubt that everything is a fuzzball. The fact you can't make all of them is a technical problem. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, people do keep asking, well, then, can't we see at least one microstate for the Schwarzschild black hole? So then we can believe it can be done. Because sometimes they say, well, maybe we agree with you. And so more and more people say that now, that we agree that all the extremal black holes and near extremal black holes are fuzzballs, but maybe the ones which are far from extremal, which are like neutral or have a very small charge or a very small rotation, maybe they still have a horizon. So right. I don't say that <laughs> to me, it looks a little strange. I mean, to me, if you solve the puzzle one way for black holes which are near to extremal, we should have the same solution for black holes, which are also far from extreme. But in principle, it's not wrong if somebody would ask you that question. And so I think having a something which is a microstate for the short black hole uh, just puts a 
peg in that corner of the space as well. So it's important because you are never going to actually make every possible state for every possible black hole. That's not the way to solve the first ball puzzle because that way you could ask, have you made every state for every planet? No, mm -hmm. we don't think there's an information paradox of planets, but nobody can make every macro state for every planet. People don't even understand these quantum liquids so far. If you know a glass of a quantum liquid, people can't write down the quantum state of it. So it's not like you're trying to uh, understand every state of every planet. You just want to see a typical example. Like if you could take a whole crystal and say, this is how it, a crystal holds up. You say, okay, I now understand the planet. So for example, with first balls, if you can understand things which have maximal charge and you go to things that have maximal rotation and things with no charge, you go to different corners of the phase space and make an example in every corner. Then you say, okay, I understand the person. So I think this is an important corner to put a peg in the mm. corner of neutral first balls. And the fact that we are almost in reach of that by this work of uh, Heidemann and Bach, I found that quite exciting. So as of now, what are the black holes people have been constructing? So if not Schwarzschild just yet, what are the black holes uh, that people have succeeded in describing uh, to a good extent with the with first balls? So the uh, simplest black hole for which we can understand the entropy puzzle uh, was a black hole developed by Ashok Sen, just predating the work of Strominger and Bafa. So that's called the two-charge extremal hole. Okay. And for that, we now actually understand all the states. And a lot of that work was, in fact, uh, done by people you know, uh, Skenderis and Taylor. Right, so right. we understand that black hole very well now, and we can construct all the wave functions. We can see the size of them, and we can see the generic one is a part of the horizon size. And there are no mysteries there. So that's very important because it's a very simple black hole. It has charge equal to mass. So you can say, okay, it's not generic. You might want black holes with you know other charges and so on. But at least in one case, if you completely understand all the states and you can see that none of the states have a singularity, none of them have a horizon, they have exactly the Bekestan entropy and their typical size is the size you expect for the radius, horizon radius of the black hole. I would say you actually understand the problem in principle. So that's a very good marker in the whole space. Then you go towards the black holes, which are more like the one the Stromage and Bafa studied. So there we know many, many families of states. So I think we know different corners of that space. And that's where some very Herculean work was done by Bina Warner and the entire group that started from there and their collaborators. Uh, then there was the, in the near extremal black holes, there was uh, some very nice work done by the JMART group and then other groups, but progress there was slow. Mm -hmm. And I think from there, suddenly to be able to jump into completely neutral ones by this thing of uh, Heidemann and Ba has been an interesting jump. But I think these are some of the different corners of fuzzball uh, constructions that have been explored. But as you were asking before, what are the other directions in the fuzzball program? So one is the construction of fuzzballs. So as I said, that's just one corner, but you know, enough things have been constructed in different corners that at least to my mind, there is no way that one wouldn't have the fuzzball uh, paradigm. I mean, that everything would have to be a fuzzball I don't think you can ever get a black hole with a horizon because again, as a small correction theorem proved, then you would be black back in the information paradox. So we know right. enough examples now that I don't expect that. So then the question would be, what lessons do we draw from it? Can we extract the basic physics from the fuzzballs so that we can then explain to people, how did we bypass the Hawking puzzle? How did we beat all the idea that semi-classical gravity was telling us there's a paradox and how did semi-classical gravity break down? at the horizon. So to extract the basic lessons and then perhaps to port them over to cosmology and other places where you know where you also get horizons. So that's, I think, one very important direction. And a second important direction, which is very closely connected to that, is the dynamics of fuzzballs. Because you might say that if you understand all the fuzzballs in any quantum mechanical theory, if you understand all the eigenstates, they are like the eigenstates of the Hamilton. For a given energy, you make all the microstates. It's like finding all the eigenstates of, let's say, the harmonic oscillator. Then if somebody asks you for the dynamical evolution, in principle, you know it, because if you just take all energy eigenstates and superpose them, with, superpose them with different coefficients, then evolve them each by the phase factor e to the minus i e t, you would get the answer for the evolution of any state. So in principle, once you have the energy eigenstates, you have the evolution. But in practice, we don't do that. In practice, we need to get a physical understanding of how something is evolving. 
And here there is a very interesting question. The whole interesting puzzle with the information paradox was the question of causality. In string theory, we still don't know anything which goes outside the light cone. If something right. traveled faster than the speed of light in string theory, you would have read about it in the New York Times. Right? So now right. let's go back to the original puzzle. Suppose a shell is collapsing at the speed of light to make a black hole. Okay. As it crosses its horizon, no particle knows the other particle is coming because if every particle is moving at the speed of light, there is no time for a signal to propagate from any of that particle and reach any other particle. If no particle knows the other particle is coming, then it should continue on its way as if the other particles weren't there, which means it just keeps going and nothing happens to it. If that were true, the shell would keep collapsing and go through its horizon, as all the GR people always told you. They'll right, go through right. the horizon. And once it's inside the horizon, now all the light cones turn inwards. This is what a horizon is. Causality doesn't allow any new physics happening at the singularity or inside the horizon to ever go out and affect the horizon or anything outside that. Well, then, if that were true, how do you change the physics at the horizon from the fact that there is a horizon? And if you can't change the horizon, you are stuck in your information puzzle. Mm -hmm. So somewhere, something has to go wrong with this logic, with our understanding of fuzz balls. We now should go back and understand what happened so that we can actually pinpoint what went wrong with the semi-classical approximation. So, 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 so in principle, you know, it, but it remains a task to do it explicitly, yes. pinpoint it explicitly. So that's the kind of thing we have been working on. And to do it explicitly in the way to understand the essential dynamics, which breaks down without breaking causality, you have to break the semi-classical approximation. And what we finally found was the reason the semi-classical approximation was breaking was very interesting. The black hole has a very large entropy. We've known that for a long time, from the time of Bekenstein, but we never knew what to do with that entropy. We knew it as a number, A over 4G, but what do we do with it? And the point is that as this shell comes in, what happens is there's an amplitude for the shell to tunnel into any one of these fastballs. And the tunneling amplitude is very small because it's a classical object of a huge size tunneling into another classical object of a huge size. And so normally you would ignore it, except that because there are so many different things you can tunnel to, you have to multiply by the number of the fuzzball states, which is given by the Bekenstein entropy, exponential of the Bekenstein entropy. And then you find the total tunneling amplitude actually is not small. It actually becomes order one. So the semi-classical approximation breaks down because of this very large entropy of the black hole. So the uh, Bekenstein entropy which was always sitting as a separate thing from the information puzzle. The information paradox says you have a horizon, you create, and you keep seeing the entanglement growing, you have loss of information. In that, you never used the Bekenstein entropy. You knew it was there, but you never used it. And now you realize it was a okay. crucial part of the solution of the puzzle. Because the Bekenstein entropy is there, the picture of the black hole you have taken, the semi-classical picture, is actually not valid. That semi-classical metric can tunnel into all these new solutions we have found, the fuzzball solutions. And the total probability of tunneling into any one of them, a linear combination of them, because there are so many of them, is actually not small, it's order one. So the semi-classical solution is not a good solution. Mm -hmm. So we had this argument a few years ago, but then what we have been doing in the last few years under the title of the Vecro hypothesis is trying to put more details into this, exactly when the tunneling happens, how it happens, what triggers the tunneling. And so we are understanding more and more of that every year. I was going to ask you, um, so semi-classical physics, I think most people agree that semi-classical physics is not the most fundamental description of uh, nature, but uh, an effective model. I was going to ask you what, what's necessarily the problem that it breaks down at certain places if it's effective. But now you're saying that um, it's not even suitable for the purposes that they're trying to, to solve. So within the realm of the information paradox, for instance, I mean, already there are these approximation breaks down. So it's not, not suitable even as an approximation to solve the problems that it's attempting to solve. Yes. So let's put the semi-classical story in perspective uh, in the history of the information puzzle because it has created lots of confusion. So what people were hoping all along, going back to the first few things that you were asking, what people are hoping all along is that they can keep their classical or semi-classical intuition that the horizon is a smooth place. Mm -hmm. 
then the Hawking calculation will produce pairs. They know that. And they said, fine. And then they were hoping they'll make a small correction to that and still get their unitarity, which they did want. And then the small correction theorem shows you that you can't have all these things. Okay. So the point is then, what can you do with the semi-classical approximation? Okay. And the point is that you cannot actually do the following, which is what people are still trying to do. And in that they are wrong. So let me try to say that there's now an even more precise version of the uh, small correction theorem. We call it the effective small correction theorem. Mm -hmm. And <clears> in <throat> that, you can see that what people are trying to do with the semi-classical approximation actually cannot be done. So what you can't do is the following. People sooner or later came to the understanding over the last, you know, maybe five years, six years or so, that in principle, probably the fuzzball idea is correct, that the black hole in the full theory of quantum gravity is not, doesn't have a smooth horizon. It is this messy fuzzball that people are finding. So people said, okay, you know, people are finding so many fuzzballs, let's agree they are fuzzballs. So then this new idea came up in the last uh, few years that if you put the full theory of quantum gravity, which let's say now is string theory in the computer and you look for the microstates, there will be fuzzballs. So they don't have a horizon. They have all this complicated quantum gravity structure and that's the exact thing. They radiate from the surface like a normal body. We'll accept that that solves the puzzle. So the fuzzball resolution is correct. But they said that may be true, but perhaps the fuzzball uh, paradigm is correct, but perhaps it's not useful. So, so that's what not one of the questions I had. Maybe that's why people are reluctant from jumping into using the fuzzball um, proposal, because it's, it's not very practical. If I want to describe something out in the universe yes. and extra extrapolate its features or understanding its behavior, may maybe it's not a practical route to do that by modeling Absolutely. it as, as a fuzzball. Absolutely. So here comes the crux of the problem, which is very important to understand. And this is what people, I think, are not understanding. And I think that's why I find many papers today to be erroneous. Mm -hmm. So let's assume the exact theory is, is fuzzball, because for that, there seems to be really no choice with all the things we have learned. So, so what they said was the exact theory is fuzzball. So if you really were going to put the whole black hole in the computer, get an exact description, you won't have a problem because it's this full quantum thing with no horizon, radiated from its surface. And so you get the normal behavior of a normal body. But they said that if I just want to get an approximate behavior of this guy, because such a complicated object, maybe I can make a semi-classical description of the region around the horizon. I'm not going to the singularity, around the horizon. In the following sense, that suppose you have a very complicated gas, like in this room, the air. I don't actually have to worry about where every atom is. That is, of course, the exact description. But if I simply want to see the propagation of a sound wave, I can just make some effective collective mode description of this room and write the sound, write the air as a fluid described by some hydrodynamic equations. And I can describe sound waves. So couldn't I make that kind of an approximation where the actual complicated fuzzball, I can just study it's some kind of collective modes where I may be near the horizon, squeeze the fuzzball, stretch the fuzzball sound like this, get some low energy waves. And that is semi-classical physics, like maybe graviton or gravity waves around the horizon would just look like that. In that case, my semi-classical physics is all true. It's like the waves in the air here, sound waves, but mm -hmm. the microscopic description is in terms of fuzzballs, just like the microscopic description of the air is in terms of atoms. Mm -hmm. It sounds very persuasive because it would then allow you to retain your semi-classical intuition while also solving your puzzle. Yes. <clears throat> very important to understand, this is not true. Okay. It's actually not possible. All right. And the puzzle comes in the following way. Suppose you could make such a semi-classical approximation and let us be very generous in our assumptions. We don't want the semi-classical approximation to work at very short lengths like blank lengths. We only want it to work at, let's say, all lengths from maybe one centimeter to 10 kilometers. Take a solar mass black hole, which is three kilometers horizon size. So the semi-classical approximation should work from, let's say, one centimeter to 10 kilometers. We also don't want it to work forever, like the black hole takes a long time to evaporate. To get the semi-classical degrees of freedom, we have to write some you have the exact degrees of freedom, let's call them uh, G exact, some effect exact metric, metric mm -hmm. G exact. But from that, there will be some map which gets me G effective, the effective metric. So there'll be some map which uh, you know extracts what's called the code subspace or a small semi-classical subspace 
or some few degrees of freedom to get the semi-classical approximation. But I even allow you to change the map later if you want. I mean, the map should work for at least a few crossing times. So it can produce maybe 10, 20 Hawking pairs. After that, if you need to change the map from the exact to the semi-classical, I'll allow you to change it. Okay, so I'm being completely generous. We, and the map also doesn't have to work exactly. It can, it, because it's an approximate map to semi-classical, it can work up to small correction, maybe 1% error. So now we have allowed you every possible way of getting a semi-classical description. Mm -hmm. And suppose you can do this. Now is the problem. In this semi-classical variables, which are some collective variables made out of the exact variables, you will have Hawking pair production because that you can't help. When a mode stretches from one centimeter to 10 kilometers, it always produces a, one or two pairs. Right. The pairs which are outside, outside we keep normal physics. So the entanglement of the outside with the inside has grown by log two. And you may say this in the semi-classical picture, how, how do we know how much it grew in the exact picture? Aha, because the semi-classical picture has to be close to the exact picture by let's say 1%, otherwise it wasn't a semi-classical picture. The entanglement in the semi-classical picture increased by log two. Uh -huh. In the exact picture it has to increase by log two plus minus 1%. Uh -huh. And now you're in the trap again. Because any small correction, let's say of 1%, will not solve your puzzle. So then you find in the exact theory now, the entanglement will have to keep growing. If it grows in the semi-classical theory, which they all allow you to do, because semi-classical theory, they say, I have a horizon. So then they have to get the entangled pairs. They agree to that. Once the entangled pair comes out in the semi-classical picture, the entanglement is growing by log two. But now come back and ask about the exact picture because the semi-classical was an approximation to the exact ask the crucial question, how much did the entanglement grow in the exact picture? Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be log 2, but it has to be log 2 plus or minus epsilon. Right, right. And now you're trapped by the power of the strong separate inequality, <clears throat> because now in the exact theory, now only talk about the exact theory, the entanglement will have to keep growing and growing and growing, and that's what they didn't want, because now the oh. page curve goes up. So everybody so by construction, is, it is always subject to this theorem. Absolutely. So what people were trying to do was have their cake and eat it too, and they can't. So they were trying to say that in the exact theory, you will uh, get a fuzzball, and so there's no problem. But there's a semi-classical approximation to the low energy dynamics, which I can extract at least for small time, at least near the horizon, at least to some accuracy. Give them anything they, you, they want. And it doesn't help because the small correction theorem doesn't care about the source of the small correction. So uh, this is the mistake that a lot of people are making these days. If they yeah, actually yeah. go back and see uh, what they are doing, it will get caught in one place or the other. So the reason that this is still a problem for such a large part of the field is that the strong subjectivity inequalities have no intuitive proof. It's a very non-trivial inequality in quantum information theory. Right. Most theorems in quantum information theory have like a one paragraph proof. But this particular one, if you open up the textbook of Nielsen and Chuang, has a 10-page appendix and then a five-page proof in the text. It has no elementary proof at all. So I think this so, is one of the reasons that people maybe are not aware, aware of it or maybe w wish to disregard it? Or I think it is that's the reason. I mean, they're all aware that this theorem is there now. They've heard about it. But they have not internalized what it means because for that they have to actually go back, look at the Hawking process, how it applies to whatever model they are working with, see what the small corrections do to that, and then see how this thing applies. And for every paper you take of the kind which is trying to still get away with some semi-classical physics at the horizon, you will find that it gets into trouble somewhere or the other. Either it will not be unitary or it will have unacceptable problems at infinity, like violation of lab physics at infinity, or it won't have a smooth horizon. But you have right. to go to the model and actually check. And because people, this theorem is of strong subjectivity, it's a theorem in quantum information theory, but because it is not intuitive, the other intuition is still grabbing people's minds that if they have something very complicated, like you know the air in the room, why can't I make an approximation where I only see collective degrees of freedom like hydrodynamics? You see it everywhere else. You take a block of wood, it has all the atoms. You never look at it. You, you tap it. You see sound waves. Everybody knows that they know how to do that. They've been learning this since high school. 
could it be it that one, work here. could it could it be that one could make such approximation just not using semi classical gravity so let me see what that means so you're firstly you're given some exact theory which radiates in a unitary way so you want the exact theory to be radiating unitarily so you don't want the entanglement to keep rising and rising so that's given right right now if you make a semi classical approximation it means that you're making a semi classical approximation to to gravity because semi classical means that you want to get the einstein gravity theory plus corrections right and then you want the quantum fields on it the matter let's say the photons or gravitons on it to given by to be given by quantum fields on curved space so when they say they want a semi classical approximation what they want to do is to take the exact theory described by some variables called g exact and to get some some functional of them some complicated function of them will be the g semi classical the semi classical degrees of freedom but the g semi classical should evolve by einstein's action up to small up to small corrections there is no other meaning to the semi classical approximation right at the moment you do that you actually cannot get what you want hmm. in the semi classical approximation this will already tell you that the entanglement keeps rising that is probably already obvious because the semi classical approximation you're back to hopkins calculation the pairs are created the important thing is because the semi classical has to be close to exact otherwise it wasn't the semi classical approximation to the real problem the exact one has to keep having its entanglement go up and you can't hide it in there is always a small epsilon allowed to you because there's always a one person difference which you can allow yourself between the semi classical and the exact but the fact that one person cannot accumulate to actually help you that is where the strong subjectivity comes right 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 <clears throat> so maybe now we can talk a little bit about some of these more recent approaches so yeah. I think I think in 2019, actually, uh, a group of people won the New Horizon Prize for calculating the entropy of evaporating black holes using actually semi-classical um, techniques. One of these people were Henry Maxfield, who was quite recently on the podcast, actually. Uh, but I've been having previous guests, including Lampros Lampro and Dominic Neuenfeld, using similar approaches. So they're using something called islands where you're in a semi-classical setting, but you have a surface, an island that, that purifies these uh, entangled pairs, which in, in some way causes the entropy to, to decrease during this purification. Um, and you gave a seminar here in Southampton, I think it was last year, about how these islands should not be taken very seriously. Uh, but some of the people working on these are string theorists too. Uh, for instance, Maldacena and Suskind, so what what is going wrong with that approach? Um, because on the on the one hand, as you said, it's semi classical. So as soon as there is correction, they have to invoke uh, the no correction theorem. But on the other hand, they are actually reproducing a page curve. So do you think that this page curve that they are um, obtaining is not done so in a correct fashion, or what what, what is going wrong there? Yeah, uh, we actually spent quite some time a couple of years actually trying to read in detail a lot of the papers written in this kind of direction that you mentioned. So that was myself and my postdoc and students, Marcel Hughes, Ben Guo, and Mother Mehta. So we sat down and we read all these papers trying to see if we could make a clear path towards something that people could understand. Uh, it was rather a strange situation because anybody I talked to who was not actually writing one of these island papers they were all saying, okay, we have heard that something is being done, which shows the page curve comes down, but nobody could actually understand how it was done. So there was a lot of confusion going on that people didn't know. People thought, people have said that something has happened and you can do something with semi-classical gravity and the, you can show the page curve comes down. There's something called islands. But if you ask anybody, okay, can you go to the board and actually derive for me what has been done and how, they would all say, no, we actually don't understand the papers. So that was a little unusual because normally if something important is done, like like the you know, Stromger mark was done, it's, people read the papers and they can understand the calculation, they can reproduce the calculation, and they can explain to you where it came from. But this time I found there was a lot of confusion in the field because anybody you talk to, either in the GR community or the string community, but apart from the people who are working on it, uh, they couldn't understand what happened. So we thought we would take it upon ourselves to read all these papers and see if we could write out a 
clear explanation of what was correct and what was wrong and what was working and what they were trying to say. So we actually wrote a long article about it in uh, 2021 November. So we have a paper explaining what our conclusions, what we learned by studying these papers. What is it called? It's called Comparing the Fuzzball and Wormhole Paradigms. All right. I think contrasting the fuzzball and wormhole paradigm, something like that. Okay. So we what, what happened was the first thing we realized was that different people in this field were actually doing different things. And that was part of the reason for the confusion. It seemed they were all saying similar things. That there was a lot of excitement. The page curve comes down. The information comes out. There's wormholes. People are hearing all these words, islands, wormholes, and so on. But the papers are not doing the same thing. So we went systematically through all the possibilities one by one, saying, OK, people can do this, or you can do this, or you can do this. And then we tried to see how in each of them you actually get into trouble, in particular, how you get into trouble with the small corrections theorem. Okay. So first, we began by uh, actually rederiving the more uh, precise version of the small correction theorem, which we call the effective small correction theorem. So let me just state that for you, and then uh, go through how each of these different approaches ends up in trouble in one or the other of these ways. Okay, so the the following can be rigorously proved that one of the following three things is going to break down. Suppose that in the exact theory of quantum gravity, let's say a string theory, you put that in the computer, you want the black hole to behave like a piece of coal and evaporate in a normal fashion. Mm -hmm. So everybody would tell you they want that. They even call that the central dogma that in the exact theory it's going to evaporate and come down. And I think pretty much everybody is okay with saying that, you know, maybe they are fuzzballs, but that's in the exact theory, but maybe we only are happy with semi-classical approximations. So we don't even care what the exact theory is, but they still want this unitarity. So suppose we are given that fact. Second, you would like to get normal lab physics far away. So suppose the black hole is somewhere. And as I go further and further away from it, the low energy physics in my room far away from the black hole should be normal low energy physics. So like if I open the textbook of Polchinski here and just say what I learned from low energy string theory, scattering of strings and all that, deep brains, all those things should be valid to better and better approximations as I go further and further away from the black hole. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> let's say that also sounds reasonable, so let's accept that, okay? And the third thing is that as these people all want, there should be a semi-classical approximation at the horizon. And that means that from these exact degrees of freedom, you make a code subspace, some kind of functional. They don't have to give you the function, but there has to be some complicated functional f of the exact degrees of freedom of the g exact, the exact metric and so on that you may say, which gives you g effective, the semi-classical degrees of freedom. And then these guys should behave as if they satisfy the Einstein equations of motion plus field theory and curved space to some approximation. So these three things you want. Okay. And you find that you cannot have these three things at the same time. One of them has to be wrong. Okay. This is the effective small correction theorem. And this, I would claim, is proved rigorously. Mm -hmm. So now let's go back and see what these people are doing because they seem to be asking for all three things to be true. Right. And so then you find in some papers, there is a secret loss of unitarity. They just haven't noticed it. So what happens is that the evolution inside the black hole Sometimes they keep changing the inner product from state to state, from step to step. And in those cases, you find that the evolution inside the black hole is actually not unitary. Okay. okay, if you're going to give up unitarity, then you are doing exactly what Hawking did because Hawking said when the black hole evaporates, you lose unitarity. But you can lose it up in steps. Like he says that all the data was inside the black hole. When the black hole finally disappears, the unitarity loss was at one go. Okay, gone at one step. Or you could do it step by step. In each step of evaporation, if the Hilbert space inside, let's say, was 20 dimensional and you squeeze it down to 19 dimensional, then you've lost one, one direction. So you could lose the unitarity one by one. So at the, at the, it's not like you lose all 20 directions of your Hilbert space at the last step. You could lose one at each step. And then so at the last step, just lose one. But it's the same non-unitarity. Mm -hmm. So either you will find built-in non-unitarity, which we showed was there in some of the models, okay, or you will find that there is unacceptable physics loss at infinity. So there are models which say, oh, I can have non-locality in gravity. I will make my semi-classical physics degrees of freedom by using degrees of freedom near the horizon and also degrees of freedom near infinity. You know, semi-classical codes for some space. So far we were thinking, just use the degrees of freedom near the horizon and make it out of those. 
But they will say, why do that? But also use the exact degrees of freedom at infinity, make some complicated combination, and thereby make the semi-classical degrees of freedom at the horizon. Mm -hmm. But if you do that, you find that you lose the semi-classical behavior that you actually wanted at infinity. You don't have lab physics at infinity. Okay. The third thing which happens is that uh, we also said that we want the semi-classical behavior at the horizon, which means that it, you must get Einstein's equation that quantum fields on curved space. And so you must produce an entangled pair at the horizon in the normal way. After that, what you do with the pair, after you go through a few expansion times, that we don't say because semi-classical approximation to break down after let's say 10 crossing times because the black hole stays for a long time and we're not even requiring the approximation be valid the same way for all time. You can make an approximation that works for a few crossing times, then you make some other map to get a code space for the next 10 crossing times and so on. But at least for these 10 crossing times, you have to produce pairs by the semi-classical way. And in some of the models, you find they don't have that. They're not actually getting the pair production. So in some of the, so uh, we actually write this down uh, in the last section of our paper, we actually show how some of the models are actually not having the pair product. So what is happening in a lot of these code subspace models, they say, okay, I produce a pair. It's entangled, up, down, minus, down, up, or whatever, two spins are entangled. Right, right, right. But this inside member of the pair that fell into the black hole, the island is just a word for the space-like slides inside the black hole. People have th think that island is something new. It's just the part of the black hole inside the horizon. Right. Exactly where they cut off doesn't matter. Okay. That word gets into defining what's an island, but doesn't matter for the purpose of the uh, information argument. But the pair you created at the horizon, the inside member of the pair which is falling in, it has to land up on the island. Okay. What you will find them doing is, once they create the entangled pair at the horizon, what they take to land up on the island at the next step is something completely different. They say, I want this at the island at the next step, but that's not what happens from the pair, from the inside member of the pair, which fell onto the inside of the black hole and should have joined the island. So, but the island already had 100 quanta. If you get another pair where the 101st quanta lands up inside the island, it's not up to you because the pair created at the horizon, that's the guy who's going to land up on the island. If you say, no, no, some other guy lands up at the island, then what we have said is the pair which was created, the inside member of the pair, it vanished and something else was suddenly put at the horizon, put, put on the island. If you do that, you will see there's a loss of unitarity there. If you let this particular guy actually reach the island, you'll find the entanglement actually grows by log two between the island and the outside because the outside member of the pair and the inside member of the pair, they were entangled by log two. That's how the entanglement was going up. If the inside member of the pair lands upon the island, the entanglement of the outside with the island has increased by log two, there's nothing you can do about it. But what they, would, they will do is, they will not let the inside member of the pair end up on the island. They will put something else on the island. So different people have done different things, which is why I'm not mm -hmm. taking a name of who does what. But one way or the other, either they don't have the semi-classical evolution at the horizon, or if they make the pair, they put something else on the island, which is loss of unitarity right there. Or they change the dot work later on to squeeze the Hilbert space so that they lose unitarity at each step in the evolution. Right. Or they have incorrect physics at infinity, where physics in the lab will break down because they have used a kind of non-locality which will conflict what's in the lab. But one way or the other, they had to be, they could not have violated the small, uh, strong similarity inequality. So you had to find something wrong in one place or the other. The only right, thing is right, different right. papers do different things which are wrong. And so that's why it's so hard to actually figure out what really the pinpoint happened. what is wrong because pinpoint it varies. Is. So, So you said that so you have one exterior mode that escapes and you have one interior mode that goes into the black hole. And so, so they argue that depending on how big this island is, it, 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 will, it will be captured by the island um, or it will escape the island still, still inside of the black hole. But you're saying that actually when they place the interior mode of the island, that's not the Hawking pair. They are doing something else. That's right. So what they are trying to do is that they are trying to put things on the island in some papers, because different papers are doing different things. Again, we have to be careful. Mm. In some papers, what they will put on the island is not what came from the pair which was created at the horizon, which means that what you create, the member of the pair that fell from the pair creation, which fell into the black hole, one member goes out, 
That's the radiation. Other member goes in. That's the guy which falls could, in. Could you elaborate a bit on this? What, why, what, why that that is not the, the antiparticle that ends up be, being on the island? Why that is something else? So it should be the what ends up on the island should be the particle which fell inside the black hole. Right, right, right. I'm saying it should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the models that you'll see people making, sometimes it is not. That's what I'm saying. By intention or by intention. not by intention? Okay. They don't realize it. They don't realize the mistake. Okay, okay. They don't realize, they don't realize that what they are putting on the island. So sometimes they say, this is my evolution. They will give you an evolution. They will say, this is my model of the black hole. This is my model of the black hole interior. They will use these words. Okay. So what will, what's the model of the black hole interior? They will say, in the black hole, I have this, this, this bits at this time. At the next step, I want the bits inside. Inside is the island. It's the same word, basically. At the next step, I want it to be this, 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 this bits. Look, I have given you a unitary model. But you can't do that. Because if you have semi-classical physics at the horizon, and a new bit was created in a certain entangled state between the outside and the inside. The member which is inside, which now joins the previous bits which were there, you can do anything with the previous bits because nobody is dictating the dynamics inside the black hole. But the new bit which has come, it has come. And it is entangled with what is outside. Yes. You can do something else with this bit now saying that once it's come into, inside the black hole, it lands on the island. It can change after that. That's fine. But this is where the problem is. The bit which fell, which was created in the pair, it was entangled with the outside as 0, 1, plus 1, 1 plus 0, 0. 0, 0 plus 1, 1, the way we write the entanglement. So it's right. an entanglement. That's why the outside is entangled with the inside. Okay? Yeah, yeah. But the now, island is supposed to break this entanglement in some sense. Break it. Suppose they say the following. At the next step in the evolution, I know I want one more bit inside. But the bit inside... Let's say just I put on the island, which is just the inside of the black hole, in the state zero. Suppose this, suppose somebody were to say that. I'm not saying mm -hmm. some given person says that, but equivalent. Of, suppose I say it's in the state zero. Okay, and then you say I'll proceed from here onwards. This is my what I claim happened inside the black hole. And look, I am not having a growing entanglement because if it is just zero, it's not entangled with the outside. And then you say, look, how did that happen? The bit which was coming in was. 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Have you thrown away the 50% prob the property the bit was actually in the state 1? What happened to that? If you have thrown it away and they said, no, the bit which comes inside is only in the state 0, you have, there, you already lost your unitarity. You have taken a two-dimensional Hilbert space, a state which was 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You have projected the inside state, which was half, half up and half down, roughly speaking, to the state 0. Okay, so that you will immediately see there's a loss of unitarity because you cannot remove the entanglement. If if you have a bit and I have a bit and they're entangled by log 2, 0, 0, mm. plus 1, 1, it doesn't matter what you do with your bit. You can change it, you can, you know, you can pass it through any Hamiltonian or Stern girl like rotate it, do anything you want. But the entanglement between me and you will remain log 2. You can change your 0 to a 1, 1 to a 0 by flipping your bit. It doesn't matter, the entanglement will remain log 2. We were 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Now we'll be 0, 1, plus 1, 0. But as long as you do something unitary, the entanglement will remain log 2. But if you said that your bit, it was 0, 0, plus 1, 1, your bit becomes only 0. Suppose you were to say that. Right, right. Then your entanglement with me has now gone away. Yes. But there is no way you can change a bit, a state which was 0, 0, plus 1, 1, apply a unitary Hamiltonian to your bit and change it to being only 0. Right, because right, we, right. it means the zero state maps to zero and the one state also maps to zero. If two states map to one, it's not unitary. So there'll be some version of this problem in everything that people do. Either they won't produce the entangled pair in the first place, or if they produce it, they will put something else on the island, which is not the member of the pair which was produced in the semi-classical. Or what has happened in some of these papers is something even more confusing. They actually say, which happened in some of the reviews that were written on the island story, that we agree the entanglement is growing. Uh -huh. So just like Hawking, we draw the old picture of Hawking, they call the inside the island, but they agree the entanglement is growing. And then they say, we should just define entro entanglement entropy differently. That is, instead of taking the entanglement of the radiation outside, 
with everything else, everything else being what's inside the black hole. Right, right, right. We should define the entanglement as being between the radiation, union the bits inside. Yes. With everything else. And then, of course, if you take the outside guys, union the inside. So and then they are purified. Each other, it's obviously pure. Mm. But this statement makes no sense because at what is at infinity, the radiation and its entanglement is actually experimentally measurable. So it's very important that you should be able to uh, figure out how to check if a given bit is entangled or not. It's right. actually an observational fact. Like suppose you give me a bit and you ask me to check, is this bit entangled with something else or not? Okay. There's a very easy way to check. I of course, I have to have many copies of this experiment. And then if it was a pure state, let's say up plus down, zero plus one, then it's actually a sigma x polarization. If I take a Stern lack which is oriented in sigma x, it will always pass it in the up state. So if you have a pure bit, a pure spin, it's always pointing in some direction. By a little bit of experimentation, I can figure out what is that direction by passing it through many Stern lacks. And then if I keep passing it through Stern lack oriented that way, it will always come out as spin up. Let's say in this case, it was spin in the plus x direction, if it was right. up plus. But if it was an entangled state, let's say up, down, minus, down, up. Let's suppose you and me were entangled in a singlet state. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter which turn girl like I passed my bit through. It will always be 50-50. If I orient my turn girl like in Z direction, it is 50-50. If I orient my turn girl like in X direction, it's also 50-50. Okay. So whether something is entangled or not is a measurable fact. It's not a, it's like saying, I can define entanglement to be what I want, and this is the way to define it in quantum gravity. No. The black hole paradox is a very, very explicit problem. You take at LHC two protons, collide them at high energy, you make a tiny black hole. Let's say 20 Planck masses, mm -hmm. 100 Planck masses, something bigger than M Planck. Okay, just to all right, all right. Yeah, yeah. 100 Planck masses, it will emit 10 to the 4 photons, they go out. You collect them in a box, you have all the time at and check if they are in a pure state or if they are entangled with somebody. Yes, yes. Okay, this is the problem. You can do it repeatedly. Again, collect the same two protons, collect them and do it. Just keep doing this repeatedly. You have as many copies as you want. You can check whether the final state is pure or entangled. It is not something open to interpretation. It is not something which is a confusion between semi-classical and exact. At infinity, semi-classical and exact are the same. Right. At infinity, once you take some bits, you have all the time, all the distance you want to, you know, you can go as far away from this initial experiment site as you want. You have all the time to analyze it. There's only one reality. This is the experiment, and the question is, is the entanglement of the state pure or entangled? And if you take any of the papers that these people give you, try to follow it down in the following path. Take their model, bit model, and first check, are you creating a pair which is entangled at the horizon? They will have to if it's semi-classical at the horizon. And I think they will agree to that. Sometimes they may not show it to you, but ask them for it. When they give it to you, at each step when a pair comes out, ask, isn't this guy entangled with the other guy? They will say yes. Entanglement has gone up. So the outside is entangled by more than by log two more with the inside than before the emission. Now ask them, how did the entanglement ever go down in this step? It's increased by log two. Every time a pair comes out, entanglement is going up by log two. How come after the halfway point or somewhere you want entanglement to go down? Now you see them giving you different answers. Either they will say, I'll define entanglement differently. Yes. Say, no, that doesn't make sense. This is the experiment. I can always check entanglement. That is nonsense. Or they will say, uh, you know, there is some, they will try to give you some model of what happened in the island, the bit inside. It was zero, zero plus one, one, but the bit inside from being zero and one just became zero. This right. is our entanglement. You say, ah, loss of unitarity inside. If you want to lose unitarity, I can always do it. Hawking could do it. They will catch it there. Right. So, just go and follow whatever they are doing step, step by step. And sooner or later, you find the problem. There were some things done by Morolf and Maxfield, where they tried to say, since you have so many copies of the universe, so of the experiment, maybe mm -hmm. all the different copies interfere with each other. Okay. And if you do that, you find in that model, there's a lack of unitarity at the baby universes. And in some papers, and in other papers, there's a lack of having the pair production. So in some papers of that kind, you find a lack of unitarity at the baby universe stage, and some papers you find they haven't actually gotten the correct zero, zero, plus one. Right, right, right. So yeah, I think it's very interesting that every paper has a problem at a different place. 
Yeah, yeah. I think some people are a bit agnostic about what's going on on the level of the quantum information, uh, because yeah. the, they so so that so they they have as you said they redefine entropy, saying that now my entanglement entropy is a quantity that is being computed when I take this area union the area of the island such that something gets purified. Um, yes, but that then means- I found many people being being agnostic about the exact mechanism of how that happens on the quantum information side of things. Uh, might be well formulated, but in my experience, so, I think yeah. people are agnostic about that. But so so a couple of things. So so the first thing is that I that there seems to be a lot of consensus about the formula that is being used to compute entanglement entropy that you take. Uh, the region of semi-classical radiation or union uh, the island, and that's how you actually compute entanglement entropy. And the second question is, so you argue that there there is no ambiguity in this problem uh, because you can measure it. Uh, you, you can see whether or not the state that you observe is entangled or not. Could one first make the argument that people haven't actually measured Hawking radiation uh, at infinity? And secondly, why specifically do you think that this formula for computing entanglement entropy is not to trust? Yes, we spent quite some time trying to understand all those papers. And I could find no way in which that formula was valid. Okay. So the actual step in the page curve derivations, which I found to be problematic, we explained that in our uh, long article on this where we looked at all the possible uh, problems with different approaches, it's the following. Uh, it's the problem of confusing a dot product with an amplitude. Okay. So you know that in physics, you often have a dot product between two states, which just means that you are at a given time slice. A dot product is something at one time. You have two states and they get an inner product. So what you can try to do, suppose I give you quantum gravity in just one dimension. So in quantum gravity has the funny thing that the dimension circle could be bigger or smaller, space itself changes. But let's take a very concrete model. Suppose I take my space and I break it into a lattice of Planck size each. So if my circle has length, 10 Planck lengths, I can make a circle of 10, 10, bit, 10 links, right? And maybe I can put a spin on each link and that's my state. So people have been doing quantum gravity for a long time and they know the inner product because people have, for example, taken 2D quantum gravity, even put it in the computer. We have solved 2D gravity so many times because we have done it in the old string theory days by you know, KPZ and DDK and all these methods. So we, and the world sheet string theory is also 2D quantum gravity. So it's not like we don't understand 2D quantum gravity and definitely has a dot product. And the dot product is that if I give you a circle of length 10 units in this discretization, and if I give you a circle of length, let's say eight units, they are orthogonal. If I give you 10 units and 10 units, with also the, maybe the same spins on each, then the dot product is one. Anyway, so it's clear you can establish a dot product and then you use it. So now what you could do is just think of two dimensional CFT. What people often do is suppose I have a state here, state here, two states at the same time, you can compute a dot product. But you can obtain the state by evolution from something else, right? You can start with some other state. Mm-hmm and evolve all the way till you get here. Right? You can also start with some other state on top and evolve all the way till you get here. It's just a way of preparing the states. Nobody right. stops from preparing it any way that you like. Right? So now that you can prepare the states in many ways because in evolution, the size of the circle also changes and so on. You can start with a circle of size eight and evolve it to a circle of size 10. It may be part of the evolution. And you can start with a circle of size seven and it evolves to something which is a linear combination of all kinds of sizes. Right, right, right. Gravity, everything. So you can so start with a circle of size seven on top and size eight on the bottom. And they all evolve to things with a linear combination of size one, two, three, up to 100, and the top guy also one, two, three, up to 100. And so then you'll find the amplitude if you join this to this is non zero because seven can transition into eight. That's obviously the part, part of gravity. And so they say, aha, we found something new about gravity. Mm-hmm. The circle of length seven is not orthogonal to circle of length eight because seven evolves down to this, eight evolves up to this, and there's an overlap. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so when this tell you they are finding new overlaps between states, 
What they're doing is a more complicated version of this. Sometimes they have many copies because in a replica trick, they make many copies and so on. But the problem is the following. If I give you, its problem goes down to something very similar. The replica trick says, make two copies of something. Now, if you make two copies, on each copy, you have a state, and then there's a well-defined dot product, and the dot product is something only at one time. Everybody knows what the dot product is. On the other hand, they would like to first recast that in terms of an evolution. You prepare the state in some way. That's not wrong. You can always recast a state in terms of something else. Mm -hmm. But then they make the mistake of saying that now that I have two states, suppose I have two copies, so I have two states at the top and two states at the bottom, now I'll say these states can also interchange. This guy can go here, this guy can go here. It's an evolution. So they allow new amplitudes which are not there in the theory. And uh, having recast the dot product and amplitude, they now put things in the amplitude which are not there in the theory. And they get a new dot product, which is not the actual dot product. So what you're supposed to compute was an, a certain dot product for use in the entanglement entropy. Right. But you use a different dot product. Okay, so then you go and say, how could this happen? This is not the dot product. Why are you doing this? So if you look at it, you clearly find that you're doing the wrong thing because up to some time you define the Rennie entropy. Suppose you want to compute a second Rennie entropy. You want trace row square. It's row times, trace row square. You will find that by replacing it by this new dot product, which is actually not the correct dot product, you replace trace row square by trace row square plus some number times trace of row whole square. Uh -huh. So what you're computing is no longer the Rennie entropy. And so what you're computing is no longer the entanglement entropy. You replace it by some other quantity. Uh -huh. Now let's ask what happened to the other quantity. And you find that once row has sufficiently many matrix elements, trace of row whole squared is always bigger than trace row square. So that term dominates. So when they go to this late time black hole, the half after the page time black hole, they're trying to compute trace row square, but that's not even relevant. The trace of row whole square dominates the answer. Oh, I see. The trace of row whole square, if you go back and ask, what is it? Trace of row is just one copy. Trace of row is what comes in compute the Gibbons Hawking entropy. Right, right, right. So what they're secretly computing is the Gibbons Hawking entropy. Oh. And so what you find is the thing which you knew all the way back from 1976, from Gibbons Hawking time, that the as the Gibbons Hawking entropy is the area of the horizon. As the black hole goes down, the Gibbons Hawking entropy goes down. If you were simply going to say the entropy of the black hole is always given by a surface area, and you can't put more than that many states in it, of course your page curve would go down. But that's something we knew from 1976. The puzzle was the actually states inside the black hole can be much more than what's given by the surface area because you, know, you can pay equation, you can put all the states inside. So the mistake in the calculation that according to us is there, that's what we found, the step we couldn't get past is that up to one step, they are defining the dot, the entanglement entropy, we need a certain dot product. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The next step, the dot product is wrong. Now, if you ask them, why did you use the wrong dot product? They say it's a prescription in gravity, which is coming because gravity has topology change. Uh -huh. but that's wrong. It's very important that's wrong. It's not like we didn't know how to do topology change in gravity before. They're using one plus one gravity. We know everything about one plus one gravity. If you take even right. Goldschmidt string theory, you have a topology of a circle. Circle breaks into two circles and joins up back into one circle. We do this all the time. Right. Right. So we know how to do topology change. Everybody agrees there can be topology change. If you're in one dimension, it means your one dimensional line can break into two pieces, join back into one piece, break into two pieces. You can do that. Right. It doesn't mean that you don't know the dot product. You perfectly well know the dot product. We've been doing string world sheet theory for all this time, and we always know the dot product on a copy of multiple copies of strings. The dot product they are using is not that dot product. But is, is this, you think, on purpose again? Or do you think this is, they're not aware of that? I think they were initially not aware of that. Mm -hmm. That's my, it, I think nobody is deliberately making a mistake. There are no dishonest people here. But no, no, I, I think, think maybe, the thing maybe is very they, they just didn't think it was a mistake. Maybe they would argue this is the right thing. They would like to argue that. Absolutely, they might want to argue that. If you ask them, is it a mistake? They may say, it's not a mistake. This is our prescription. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let's go down into it and see how it can be a prescription. Let's see what it means for it to be a prescription. Right. What are we saying for it in terms of the theory of quantum gravity? It has to be something because a statement about what is the dot product. Let's see what they are physically saying. And then you find the statement 
is actually very interesting because I've talked to some people doing that. They're saying that, that in the exact quantum gravity theory, if you put in the computer, mm -hmm. you shouldn't do this. It should just be the normal dot product. You don't do okay. this. Okay. They agree to that. Okay. Then they say, if you make a semi-classical approximation to that, in that you should do this, add all these extra things which shouldn't be there. Hmm. Okay, that's what they're telling you. Now you ask, how can that be true? Let's assume it is true, then it must follow that if I take the exact quantum gravity theory in which dot part is, you know, just as I said, a slice with 10 bits and a slice with eight bits are orthogonal, right? And now they're saying a slice with 10 links and a slice with eight links are not orthogonal. Right. So they say in the semi-classical approximation, this happened. So you ask, okay, can you give me any example, maybe even a toy example, where in the exact quantum gravity theory, you know, two things, two states of the same slice were, uh, you know, orthogonal. In the semi-classical gravity theory, they're not orthogonal because it's not like we don't know how to take semi-classical approximations before. For example, if you take a look at canonically quantized quantum gravity done by all the GR people by the wheeler dewitt equation. Right, right. You know how to take a semi-classical limit. It's called a WKB approximation. Mm -hmm. And in that semi-classical space-time emerges. They did all this long ago for us. All the you know, decoherence, the WKB. And it's, it's all been worked out in great detail. Let's do that and ask if when you do that, does it happen that if you take the dot part of two circles, if you have two copies of something, in the exact theory, you dot each copy with itself. But semi-classical, you're supposed to dot this copy with this also and this copy with this also. Let's see if anything this funny happens to change your rule of how you define dot products anytime you take a semi-classical approximation to any case that we know. You can take field theory, you can take quantum gravity. We know so many cases of taking semi-classical limits. It's a very old thing in physics. And not a single example is known as anything like this ever happens. So that, I think, is the important thing. I at least don't know one. The question we have to ask them is, we should really clarify what's been done, right? I don't want to say that what they are doing is wrong because it's for them to sort of clarify what's being done. Right, I'm just right. saying that we couldn't find out how it could be correct. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. So we I tried see. every possible way to justify it, but we couldn't find a way. And so we broke it down into its essence just to see where was the first step coming. Yes. Where it did, wasn't making sense and we couldn't fix it. And we found it was because up to one point, they were saying we know the states and we know the dot product. And then they were saying, but in the semi-classical limit, the dot parts were given by this rule. And we can't see how by anything you do to get a semi-classical variables as a code subspace of the exact variables, you will ever get such a rule. Then the reason they give for that is because you have topology change in gravity. But that we know is not true because topology change you can do in, let's say take the CGHS model or the world sheet string theory, which is 2D quantum gravity. You can always allow topology change. We've always allowed strings to break and rejoin. It's not like we don't know topology change. It doesn't mean we don't know the metric. Metric on this Hilbert space of n strings where they can join and reach and break is known. So you say know. say that you would say that that this would actually work. What is the motivation of going down this path given that the information paradox is absent uh, in the fastball proposal? It's very interesting why people are doing all this. The information paradox, in my opinion, has already been over for almost 15 years. After we wow. got enough examples of fuzzballs, there was really no chance there's any other solution. Initially, people were fighting it because they thought small corrections would work. But after the small correction theorem of 2009, there was no reason to still worry about the information puzzle. Because you know that you need an order one correction at the horizon. The problem always was there was no way to get it because the no head theorists were telling you everything falls in and leaves your vacuum at the horizon. The first ball mechanism showed you how you can actually get structure at the horizon. And the answer was that the compact dimensions, which everybody had assumed were trivially tensored with the non-compact dimension. Everybody thought they were small circles that, you know, just go for a ride. So forget it and think about three plus one gravity. It doesn't work like that. The compact dimension, the non-trivially fibered over the non-compact dimensions they pinch off and create non-trivial structures. And the number of these structures is so large that this is what accounts for the Bekestein entropy. For the case of the case of the two charged black hole, which is completely solved, we know this exactly. So all the microstates are here. 
hiding in the fact that the compact dimensions fiber non trivially over the non compact dimensions. And with that, all the no head theorems are bypassed. There's a beautiful paper of Gibbons and Warner, which explains how all the no head theorems are broken by this structure. So we know how the information puzzle is solved. And we know that if you don't create this structure at the horizon and order one change, you can't solve it. The puzzle is over. The reason that people are still trying to struggle with this is very interesting. So I'm glad you asked. What they're trying to do is to somehow still save a semi-classical horizon. Uh -huh. And so you might ask, why are you doing that? Because you already know that if you get a semi-classical horizon, it will create the pairs and you'll have your entanglement problem again. Why do you want it? And the reason came from something which is not to do with black holes, but do with ADS CFD. Right. It's the wrong reason, I think. What happened was that in ADS CFD, people realized that if you have a very complicated Yang Mills theory on ND3 brains, you can, of course, solve the very complicated Yang Mills theory by putting it in a computer, or you have an effective description, completely beautiful and captured by saying you just take empty ADS space and it just describes the same dynamics by just gravity in weakly coupled space. So what people were thinking at the back of their mind was, could something like this happen for the black hole? There's one very complicated description in terms of fuzzball, which is like the Yang Mills exact complicated description of something strongly coupled, which I don't want to really deal with. But uh -huh. also a simple description in terms of the analog of the ADS supergravity, which is so simple to deal with in comparison to the large and Yang Mills. Uh -huh. And that would just be the semi-classical physics around the black hole horizon. It's not exactly the same though, by the way. In the ADS CFT, one was a Yang Mills field theory and one was gravity. Here it's sort of gravity to gravity. There's the exact first ball, which is also gravity. Uh -huh. And the semi-classical approximation, which is also gravity. So it's a little bit different, but you can see why the idea is roughly similar. So everybody who accepts ADS CFT, which I also do, I think it's a beautiful theory, it's a beautiful discovery, it's all true. But I think it suggested to people that maybe there's an effective description of the horizon so that even if the exact theory is first balls, maybe we can get the semi-classical physics to come out. But as the effective small correction theorem proves to you, you cannot have it. But they are still struggling with it because they want it so badly. But then you find every time you try to do it, there is a mistake. Right? And so the reason that it doesn't work here but works for ADS CFT, it's very interesting. It all has to do with the entropy. Uh -huh. In ADS CFT, you start with D3 brains, which are in the vacuum state, uh -huh. a unique state. And the dual to that is ADS, global ADS. It's a unique state. You map one state to one state, extensions around that and extensions around this. It's beautiful. And now you come to the black hole. The black hole with a horizon has a very large number of states, a to the s. Suppose somebody could replace it by smooth horizon, vacuum, which is what they are trying to do. That is one state. You are bound to lose information. You cannot take an effective approximation or a code subspace or something which has many states and to try to replace it with something which has one state. And so the fact that it worked from vacuum to vacuum, vacuum ADS mapped to vacuum uh, Yang Mills. That's uh -huh. correct. But whenever you have an object which is specified by its entropy, the black hole size is completely defined by its entropy, there's no analog of holography. So it's very ironic that holography idea started with black holes, but you can't use holography to actually replace the horizon by smooth space uh -huh. for the purposes of Hawking radiation. So if you actually want to get Hawking radiation, the actually information puzzle, which is the only thing you are focused on. Not high energy things like a man falling in. We talked about that before. Let's leave that up. We are interested in the Hawking pairs coming out, right? So for the purpose of the information puzzle, Hawking radiation, mm -hmm. lesson is you cannot replace the complicated first ball by any semi-classical approximation. If you do any of these attempts to getting a page curve, getting a formula for the island or having all these formulae, in each of them, you will run into trouble. It breaks down at some level. It will break down somewhere or the other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can't explore all the papers. We explored whatever we found at the time. We tried to read up. We read over 100 papers at that time and analyzed them. Mm -hmm. And we tried to mix and match things to, we don't go and say, okay, this paper is wrong position. We just said, these are different categories of things which can go wrong. And then every paper has one or more of those issues, in our opinion. Right, right, right. And so <clears throat> we analyzed we try to filter out all the difficulties and mostly they are very subtle. 
And so people may not have noticed that they have a lack of unitarity. They may not notice that their dot product uh, is not the correct dot product. Sometimes they may notice, they may not notice that they have the wrong physics at infinity. But overall, you can't have all the things they want because that is a rigorous theorem. And then yeah. people have said, the theorem may not be valid because you have non-locality in quantum gravity. It's not true. Non-locality or quantum gravity has a very precise meaning. In my lab here, the physics of low energy string theory as per the textbook of Polchinski should be valid as the distance of me from any black hole is made larger and larger. If you violate this, I think you've lost something that people would like to keep. Right, right, right. And so when the people say gravity is non-local, no, it's not non-local. This is what I'm calling non-locality and this you want. I think this is partly because of politics too. I, th I think because you have started to push it, you really want to see it through and you use all the arguments you have to see if, if there is anything you can extract from this. Yeah, I don't want to use the word politics. I think there's a deeper problem underlying all this, which is that the amount of material a young person has to learn oh. to understand everything that is happening has just become too much. You first have to know all of string theory. Yes. And then you have to know all of the quantum fields in curved space that you need to understand Hawking's work. Then you need to understand all those things that were developed with black holes in string theory, which requires all of understanding strominger Wafa and then you have to understand all the fuzz ball constructions and then all the strong similarity theorems and all that. And you are finding that people just don't have the ability to put all that in a place to understand all the tools. And so if you find a young person today, they will often say, my expertise is in ADS CFT, but I don't really know string theory. Right. I work in ADS CFT and quantum information. Or I work in black holes and quantum information, but I'm not a string theory. And it doesn't mean anything. Because right. if you want to know the states of the black hole, the states you're talking about, you have to understand how they came from string theory. What are deep brains? What is the nature of their wave function? Right. You have to know Hawking's original derivation of radiation and where locality is, what can be local and what is not allowed to be non-local in string theory. And people don't know that. So considering how vast this field is, as you said, how are you managing this yourself with, for, for instance, your PhD students when there is an enormous amount of topics to learn to, to, no, to get sort of a full it perspective a on this? So I think what we do is we spend a large part of each day just talking about the physics. I think what has happened is that people have become very computational. If a new idea comes that I can use a formula, they will just jump on it, pick it up, and write two more papers using the formula. Yes. But I think it is very important, at least for the older people, people like me, I suppose, to <laughs> talk about the physics to the younger people all the time. And we spend a lot of time talking about that. You know, what is the black hole? What did Susskind say? What did Hawking say? What was wrong with this? What was wrong with that? What was the firewall argument? Even things we are not writing a paper on right now. We spend a lot of time in talking about it, making simplified models. And I insist everybody learn string theory properly. I think without that, you're only floating in free air. Right. You have to be able to go and do a, you know, scattering between two D brains or the force between two D brains or the scattering of a particle of a D brain. You must know that much string theory. Otherwise, you really don't know the basics of, you know, what you would need to really understand the black hole. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, considering that all, all this, as you said, ADS, CFT and modern quantum information has sort of branched off from ideas and prescriptions in string theory. That's right. It's a very central but I Central think the thing, simple thing that everybody seems to be missing the most is that they do not know Hawking's own calculation. It's amazing how many people will not be able to go to the board and show you how pairs are created from the vacuum at a horizon. They have never solved that. And so that's the intuition which is missing in so many people who came from the string theory side. Because string theory people come from the particle theory side, like scattering amplitudes to string scattering amplitudes. And this is very different. You have to have, understand horizons, closed traps, surface, and so on. Where are the slices expanding? Why are pairs being created? And so if you don't understand why the pairs are being created, you find people are not starting from the key point. Okay, a pair particle came out, a particle came in. I can literally see the entanglement between them. What is happening to this entanglement? How is it actually not increasing? What have you done? You should right. be able to go back and ask them what happened to it. And the very surprising answer you get, which to me is very surprising and little, you know, disappointing. They say, that's what we haven't figured out. We don't know what happens to the pair creation, but we figure out the page curve comes down. 
and you say it can't be look it's actually increasing in front of your eyes the entanglement what do you mean by saying the page curve comes down and you just haven't understood what happens to the information and this, that's the part we haven't understood but we are working on it and this makes no sense mm. because this is where the problem is if your pair is coming out and you are seeing the entanglement growing and you don't know what's gone wrong with that it's your job to see why your other calculation is giving you the wrong answer we went through all the papers we did and we found where the mistakes were where we think the mistakes are but really people have to find their own mistakes themselves and that's not happening if they say if you show them the pairs are increasing the entanglement from then on it's their responsibility to see how this question is answered in whatever they are doing is the dot product wrong is their entanglement wrong is it is their unitarity going perfect is their is their infinity going wrong and people are just not worrying about errors in their own work anymore somehow people are too busy because there is so much to learn and they have to write papers because they have to get their post up they have to get a job the sociology of the field somehow we have made it impossible for the young people there's so much oh, to learn because we demand that I mean, on, on the one side you can as you said you can you can see some some formulas in one of these papers it's easy to apply it and squeeze out a couple of papers and it might might help you to get a job but it's yes. not really doing you any favor as you said because you you end up floating in air absolutely Because Absolutely. you don't Absolutely. really understand, I mean, uh, the physics and the string theory and these underlying so pillars. You try to talk to any of the young people. The people are in an impossible situation. They have five years of their PhD to learn everything, write papers, and move on to a postdoc in a very competitive environment. And if you say you have to go back to Hawking's paper and understand how the radiation came, they say I don't have time for that. I'm just going to ask my advisor that how it works, and if he's okay with it, I don't want to know. and then if you try to talk to this person that i think this is going wrong in your model it's not his fault that he can't understand what you're saying and so i think what we really need to do is there need to be a lot more relaxed maybe summer schools review articles but more than everything else the advisors themselves encouraging the students to really understand the basics of the original pair creation you start at the hawking's pair creation if you're solving hawking's problem at least read hawking's paper right. and then look at the pair creation and you decide what happened to it so that you can explain to somebody what happened to it make a simple bit model and tell me what happened to it you know travel to places where people have worried about it and try to explain to them what you're saying but somehow people are only talking to people who also work on the same thing so people doing island will talk to other people doing islands and then nobody tells them what's wrong right right so i think you had mentioned the word sociology before so i think this is where it comes in it's not politics so much as the fact that the situation has become very difficult for young people to learn everything produce enough and write a paper in a very competitive field and so i think a lot of papers very unusual that papers can actually be wrong it never happened before in string theory everything things may not have been interesting but they were never wrong right right right, right. now there are papers which i would say are actually wrong you can show that this thing is not unitary it said it was unitary it's not or they said there were entangled pairs being created but look clearly they are not so this is unusual and i think it's because of the enormous amount of information required to uh, understand what's happening right 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 <clears throat> so speaking about the vastness of theoretical physics i wanted to also get your input on something um, a bit different so now in the area of ai has gotten a lot of attention chat gp3 i mean everyone has been using that a few times what yeah. do you think the role of this will be in the physics sort of short term and long term i'm not quite sure if it can be useful in understanding deep issues in physics because somehow i think the only part of theoretical physics worth doing is where you need to think about a problem very deeply for at least several years so anything yeah. you need to do quickly which needs a vast amount of information quickly that's where computers are good but yes. that's not where progress can be made in theoretical physics but what i think will happen is that it may become an even better thing than wikipedia for getting references like right now if i want to know anything i was searching for you know renormalization of the stress tensor in curved space the other day i just typed that into google and actually gives me the correct references in a flash it will send me to you know maybe candler's paper or fulling's paper or questioner's fulling or something like that and that is just amazing and i think it may become even better if after chat gpt and ai improve a little bit i can just say to them can you just tell me what are the right papers to read 
if I want to learn about the regulation of the stress tensor on curved space. And uh, it just tells me, I think you should go and read this, this, this. So it can collect from even more because I think the job of AI is to just take my words and parse them even better than just typing them into Google. Yes. The yes. actual thinking that it is doing to slightly elucidate what I'm doing, I, what I'm asking, that has not been working very well from what I understand. So I think the it'll just become maybe an add-on. Wikipedia is great. It has a you know, initial thing on everything. Google is great because it directs me either to Wikipedia or to even review articles or other papers. So Google plus Wikipedia has been a great combination. The archive, of course, is fantastic because all papers are available free. So that has been great. So the, we have had a lot of progress in being able to access information. And I'm just really thinking that AI will make that even easier. So uh, you don't necessarily think that AI in the future, in principle, could come up with new physics ideas or new physics theorems. So for example, if Newton had a very, very advanced chat GPT, could that in principle give him Einstein's um, field equations? So I think it's very interesting that you were asking a little while before about the why there was so much confusion in this field about you know islands and so on. And I was saying that some of these papers, I can't even make sense of them after having sat over them for two years. I think the nature of the field that has grown around this area is maybe a lesson for what is happening also with AI and chat GPT. If you don't completely know what you're doing, what evolves is a bunch of disconnected things mm -hmm. which are being put together in a way which is not correct. So if you mm -hmm. roughly know what is information, you roughly know what is black holes, and you roughly know the string theory, and you roughly know that there can be non-localities maybe in something somewhere, and you put them together and make a soup of it somewhere, you can produce papers that look almost reasonable. But if you really dig into them for years like we tried to do, you can't actually make sense of them. And so it's something similar which has happened with chat GBT. It knows all the phrases and all the words. But what it produces is so random that it's only correct a fraction of the time. And so I'm, what I'm more worried is going in the other direction. Even the part of not to go further into chat GBT, but even the part of physics that we want to know and preserve we don't want to get into a domain where every student has so little information and knows only such a small corner that the overall intelligence in the field is not with any one person, but sort of distributed. This guy may know quantum field in code space. This guy knows string theory. This guy knows, a, knows quantum information. We sit together and we just pull out something which sounds reasonable to us over a couple of beers and that's a paper. Mm -hmm. And that's what we don't want to be because okay, that's but... when we start producing things which are nonsensical. Yeah. Everybody must understand fully what they are doing. And I think we're already beginning to lose our moor moorings in this field is what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, one of the thoughts I've been having is that maybe, may maybe in the future it could just be so complicated. So it's not, it, it won't be feasible. Or maybe at least you will have to spend a significant more amount of time in your career uh, catching up with things learning certain topics at, a, at more topics that emerge and it becomes more advanced. So either like you would have to become specialized or you have to come to terms with that. You, you have to do many, many, many more years worth of reading before you can be productive. That's an excellent question. And people had always thought about this. I'm actually thinking it has already happened. So the worry always was that the amount of things you need to learn before you can actually understand everything fully to really make further progress. Suppose it in principle became so large that a person in his lifetime couldn't reach that point. So their science scientific progress stopped because it just can't, you know, right. learn everything past uh, to go further. It is almost happening like that because as we were saying a moment before, if we have to learn string theory and quantum field on curve space and, you know, quantum information theories and so on, and then be able to produce papers, that requires a good 10 years of work. But who's giving that to you? Because they want you to get a job after applying in five years. And so in some sense, we are already at the point that we are beginning to lose it. And so I think the only solution to that is, firstly, that there must be a much bigger interaction between at least the senior people to filter out what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, write review articles which are very filtered and very clear so that people can really pick up what is needed and not mm -hmm. other things. 
to collate and collect everything properly, filtering out everything which is wrong. And if that is not done and everybody says, okay, I have a theory for the black hole. I have a theory for the black hole. And I, there are 20 theories and, and everybody's just having fun with them. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? All I need to do is write a paper. If you're in that mood, I think we'll very soon reach a point where we actually can't make progress because nobody really knows what they're doing. Right, right. That's really my worry that we might already be stepping into that domain. Yeah, We're not yeah, really I... there that you can't do it, but I think we should at least be aware that we don't want to do it. Yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess that would be a solution and perhaps in combination with, I mean, not rewarding it. Because right now, I mean, the, the, the reason people are doing it is because it seems to be rewarded. Like, so, so it works like for, for the purposes of... Uh, making progress in the career. Absolutely. I think it is very, very confusing that the way physics has evolved, you need to write five papers in your five years of PhD on something that is topical, which will get citations. Otherwise, you're already filtered off the market because you won't get a postdoc. And I think something about the entire way positions are funded and moved has to change. And yeah. I think it is a little better in Europe, but I think it has become very overheated maybe in the US. That people have to chase a fashion. And the fashion thing was okay as long as there were only a few fashions. But <laughs> I think it's getting more and more difficult for the young people. Uh, I see, I see. So you have been in theoretical physics for quite a while and you have come up with many things. Can you recall some of the most memorable moments in your career? It's <laughs> a good question. So one thing I often remember is that, you know, uh, in 1997, my younger daughter was to be born. Mm -hmm. So we were in the maternity ward at Brigham's Hospital in Boston. I was still at MIT in those days. Mm -hmm. And so I was walking at night, you know, uh, walking up and down the hall, carrying this little baby in your arm because they don't sleep at night. And I was running these, I'd been thinking about this black holes for about six and a half years at that point. And I was running all these numbers of deep brains in my head. And that's where I actually found the size of the deep brain bound state is going to be of the order of the horizon size. Okay. And then I come back to the room where my wife is sleeping at night and she needs to sleep. And so by the small bedside light which they give you for the husbands to lie in a corner in that room, on the little pad they had lying on the side in the hospital, I actually scribbled it out and found numbers actually fitted. So, so that, wow, that's wow. the first ones were discovered. So that is, my daughter was born May 29. This thing... Huh. We wrote on May 30th, and the paper is from June of that year. So uh, so I, I actually can't forget uh, at least when all this. So it was quite an illumination for me because for all those years before that, it was only disappointment after disappointment. We think we got something about the information. We tried everything that other people had tried and more. You know, we tried complementarity. We tried you know, versions of small corrections, and we had tried the wheeler debit equation. We tried our own methods, the hoops ideas. We followed them all to the last. And after we'd always find there's a flaw. We just can't get the unit direct to work. Hmm. And then here it was finally everything falling into place. Okay, the whole thing has that size. All the parameters cancel out, always grows to the size of the horizon. To me, it was clear it had to be right from then onwards. But but it was really very memorable, if you ask. Yeah, that's very, very memorable circumstances. So uh, did you get the chance to thank uh, the hospital and uh, your child in the acknowledgement, maybe? Well, my child always oh, says that, you know, she brought me good luck. But uh, she's always very upset. If I ever have to remember which year she was born, I go back to when the paper on first balls were and subtract. And then I say, aha, you must be 25 now. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Uh, yeah, that's a good strategy, good strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one question that I also wanted to ask you, because as you said, I mean, this, this is being such a big part of your life. Do you have any non-scientific pursuit that you sometimes do to sort of get out of a specific problem, sort of reset your brain a little bit? Do you have any hobbies or anything outside of physics? Well, maybe not exactly outside, but one thing which I find very interesting is that I find the teaching of physics in schools is very confusing. And so I've been trying to see if one could write some physics books which are for very young people, like grades three, four, five onwards, which you just start playing with, just like fun books or workbooks. So okay. that by the time you get to grades 10 or 11, all the ideas are very well set in your mind. And you know, it's not confusing anymore. Because right now what's been happening is they 
have somehow been teaching physics in a confusing way right from high school. It's all dumped at you very suddenly at a very high level, already including calculus. And I think the weakness starts right from there. And then college just makes it worse because you have a weak foundation. You swallow a lot of things without really understanding. And the grad school makes it even worse. And I think some of the issues we were talking about before really stem from not having spent enough time on the basics all the way in school. So I was, we tried to write these small kids books and I wrote the first volume for myself and I've been okay. just trying to show it to kids. And it's surprising. I thought I wrote it for kids of grade five, but kids of grade three are happily able to do it. Wow. So, so it's interesting that young kids are actually very good if you ask them the question the right way. We all have an intuition for what physics is. You know, it's just throwing and pushing and pulling. That's all it is. And you just have to convert that into understanding the language of forces and momentum and so on. Right, right, right. As long as everything is done in pictures and very small steps. And, you know, each year do you do a little bit, little bit to just pictures and workbooks, you know, fill in this box, fill in that box, write something here. I think we can really improve our understanding of our teaching of physics. So it's just one of my hobbies. And, you know, I work with a group which is trying to teach school kids somewhere. Uh, those are very you know, elementary school kids and try to write this book on the side. And uh, I just put it on the web sometimes so everybody can read it. Once okay, it so so where are these books? Um... I haven't put it out yet because I'm still trying to polish it. I mean, I've just given it to some groups of kids to play okay, with and okay. give feedback. But I'll just put it on my homepage at some point. Uh, but yeah, the, the, so that's kind of a hobby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is very interesting. I mean, giving kids some time to digest these ideas. Yeah, I think you should so... grow with it slowly because I've seen when people learn music, like when my daughters learn music, they make them start at age five and each year they learn you know one more thing on the piano and when by the time they reach grade 12 you know their fingers are flying on the keyboard with you know yeah. 10 fingers doing 10 different things but yeah. if you tell someone to learn all that in one year in an intensive course in grade 12 you can't do that right, so you right, know right, right. you have to start with you know one finger things you know playing mary had a little lamb when you were five years old and that's i've seen them grow up through it and i think there's no fast way to learn physics oh, oh. i think somehow we are crushing it more and more even in school. Right. And really there's no cause for it. And it's happened more in the US than in Europe. Here, all of physics is taught in just one year and oh. directly at the AP physics level. Hmm. And it's just impossible. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, it really is. And I, I think that, I mean, it is a very complicated subject, it's very complicated ideas. So, what might as well learn it? at a stage in your life when you're very receptive for these yeah. new ideas and sort of it takes a special place in your mind also if you're a kid then i mean the older you get the sort of harder it is to cement certain I ideas think what's more important is that ideas can only be learned if you discovered them yourself if someone told you something it never really finds a place so if you think about them slowly you get into the mode where you sort of discover something. You can discover it from a book, you can discover it by listening to a lecture. But unless you sort of discovered, fell into place completely for yourself, you never really know it. But what happens if you don't understand that you can do that at high school, then in college also you just stuff formulae. And you never really understand that where they came from. You don't have a feeling for them. And then in grad school you swallow even more formulae without understanding where they came from. And that's part of what is happening all the way at our research level now you then start swallowing formula at the research level without knowing where they came from. So I think it's the same problem all through. How did you deal with this yourself coming up? Did you spend a considerable amount of time sort of digest things and think things through very carefully? I did, in fact, because in fact, at the time when I was getting my school education in India, science started right at grade four. Right? It's progressed by small steps every year. So there'll be physics a little bit every year and you move up in steps. Mm. And what was interesting was that I actually moved from school to school. My father worked for the railway system. I was never in any school for more than a year and a half or so. So I would always have to learn things on my own anyway. Mm -hmm. I never learned anything right. from teachers. Some years I didn't get to go to school at all because I was just in transition. Mm -hmm. So I think it's once you get used to just extracting something from a book, you realize that's the best way to learn. Mm -hmm. But the book has to be such that you can actually extract it easily. And that's why I was trying to write this simple workbook that, you know, if a book is something where you can understand things very clearly and then you extract and everything keeps falling into place, aha, aha, and you get confidence that you can always extract something for yourself. Then one day you'll be, you know, playing with your own ideas the way you, you know, after 12 years of learning piano, you can compose tunes of your own, which is what I see my daughters doing. But uh, 
for that, you have to get to a stage where the basics were really learned in a way that they were internalized. Right, and not, right, right, right. If you swallow different pieces of information, they are like different dots in your brain, which are not interconnected, but they have to actually grow like a tree, but every dot is connected to the previous ones and forms a hierarchy where you can go back and fetch anything. But uh, I think they're not connected in people's minds the way they learn it these days. Because high school is so stressful and then so is college. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So maybe some advice for sort of younger people would be to to f focus more on the understanding rather than being stressed about running Absolutely. with... I would always say that. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's good to know. I mean, so, so the majority of the people listening to this podcast are uh, graduate students. So okay. Very early on in their career. So uh, that's good to know. I would say that. Yeah. yeah. But Samira, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. I know that you have been so generous with your time today and that we have to wrap this up. Uh, you are, of course, one of the one of the great physicists and thinkers that we have. Uh, we're very, very thankful and grateful that you wanted to come up and offer your mindset and explanation of all these very complicated topics. I certainly learn a lot and I'm sure that many other people have too. So uh, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. It was indeed a great pleasure to be here.